So can I, if I fold that into you, yep. you get that strap on it, adjustable that you have? Mm-hmm. Maybe keep the same strap as the, uh, as the hook. Yeah. You can tell it's warmer over here in my hand. Yeah, it's definitely warmer. Yeah. Question is, we try to make it one more fold or knock. Yeah. <laughs> End of the pizza towards the crust. Let me release this last adjustable. This is to come into you, right? Mm -hmm. What's that thing? Okay, I'm going to hold it. Get the adjustment. I'm pushing it. Anything to hook it to? Hook it to you. Hook. Yeah, nice. Okay. Now it should go back to the bag. I don't know if there's any point in trying to fold it one more time or not. Maybe once it's right next to the bag. Yeah. So that one is cinched up. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go circumferentially around to the other side so I can be on the other side of the bag. Okay. And that node three pressurized mating adapter cover removed. The astronauts are now working to stow it into the ORU bag. Twenty seconds to hand over. In this view, you've got your flight control team for the day. Allison Bollinger is the lead flight director down in the blue shirt and black jacket. To her right, Canadian Space Agency astronaut Joshua Kutrick serving as the ground IV and communicating the tasks from the ground to the International Space Station. We just want to check that the bag is closed up and then we're going to pause for glove and half inspections from each. Okay, the bag is closed up. You got the, 
the backstop end is closed since C, right? So, yep. Cap is dry, so that's still good. And gloves wise, my right glove still looks to be in good condition. Left glove, a little bit more RTD on the index finger. But other than that, no change. Copy, Bob. Navy 2, dry hat. Gloves look really good, actually. I don't see any change at all. Copy, Chris. Um, so at this point, Chris, we're going to proceed with a cable tie back. This has you going in towards the center disc cover, and you're looking for the connection uh, on the antenna side. It's 1004 plugged into on the CBCS side, 1449. That's what we want to find in D-Mate. On the antenna side, 100. 1004, right here. Affirmative. It should be plugged into 1449, and we're we'll go for D-Mate. Chris Cassidy looking to disconnect and tie back the external wireless communications cable in this area. And Chris, for your positioning, once that D-mate is complete, 1004 will be getting tied back on the handrail that's sort of uh, adjacent to your left boot. It'll be rail 0661. 0661. Yeah, just on your left hand now. We show there being uh, wire ties already there, a short one and a long one, and we'd like you to tie 1004 off to the white taped long wire tie. To the white taped long wire tie. Copy that. And Bob, uh, see you already over the center disc cover. We're going to be looking to pre install one long wire tie on the Zenith, Zenith CDC handhold. Okay, first I'll put the cap on if that's okay. Sounds, sounds good. It can uh, mate to any cap. Okay, there's only one available cap here. Roger. And then you want me to pre-install a wire tie to the Zenith? Good words, Bob. Zenith, CDC, CDC the handhold, and uh, the, the long side of that wire tie, we want to bias towards the CBCS opening. And Bob Benkin just mated one of the cables Cassidy disconnected to an empty cap. He will now tie it back with a wire tie to secure it. And Chris, as you go about that tie back of 1004, looking to make sure that it stays clear of the CBM ring. Roger. Ball's always right side up. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know how this handrail got underneath the cable. Is this an on orbit installed handrail? No, no it's not. And Chris, we don't think it is uh, negative. Chris, further words on that tie back that we do, Shield 3 is going to be coming right on top of it, so as long as it's flat up against structure, we don't anticipate problems. Okay.
This view from Chris Cassidy's helmet camera as he wire ties that cable back. Back is complete. Copy, Chris. Just finishing up uh, some tie backs with Bob and uh, Chris, if you wanted, you could position up by the crew lock bag. Next, you'll be retrieving uh, two tether extenders for the shield tie backs. Copy. In this view here, you have a great view actually of those shields that are about to be tied back by the astronauts. Your go to uh, remove it, Chris. You can see the numbers two, three, and four. Cassidy and Benkin will work simultaneously on shields two and four to tie those back and into place. And then Cassidy will move on to tie back shield three with Benkin's help. This is all in preparation for the arrival of the NanoRax airlock later this year. And Bob, we see you starting to wrap the wire tie around those three legs. Just a reminder to open up the flap uh, before you do end up pulling it all the way back. Copy. Looks good, Bob. And so at this point, looking to capture all three of those 1449 cable legs into your one long wire tie and gently pull it back to the edge of the CBCS opening, um, back strongly enough so that it doesn't get in the way and weakly enough so that we don't deform kind of right in the middle. Okay. And Chris, yeah, we, we, we concur. Chris, since you are working with pit pins already, a we'll, uh, couple cautions there. Um, basically, the shields are good for tethers and translation when they're installed with the quarter turns, but once we start pulling them back, we want to limit any inputs onto the shields to 45 pounds force. Bob, uh, checks for the end of your task. We'll be looking to confirm three half twists in the wire tie. Yeah, got that three half twists and the long wire tie, and it appears to be pulled over to the uh, pretty well and kind of a little bit integrated with the other the caps over here because there's a bunch of big bundle. See that configuration. Copy, Bob. Uh, copy on the three half twists and copy on the WVS. We see it. It looks to be in a good config.
and Bob, I just received final word. We're happy with the CBCS. So next for you would be uh, up to the crew lock bag to retrieve two tether extenders in preparation for the shield tiebacks. And the crew will be moving on to tying back those shields that you can see numbered there, two, three, and four. You also may have noticed it got darker outside the International Space Station. The station is flying 261 statute miles over the North Pacific Ocean in an orbital nighttime. Copy. As our astronauts continue this work preparing for the future NanoRax airlock, we are still accepting Ask NASA questions. So if you're watching live, uh, send us a tweet on Twitter with the hashtag AskNASA. This one from Haley asks, how does being underwater in the spacesuit at the NBL or Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory mimic the same concept as they do their actual spacewalks? You're onto something because being underwater is the closest we can get on Earth to experiencing weightlessness or microgravity. Being in the spacesuits underwater also allows the astronauts to understand how it feels to maneuver in the suit in that type of environment. First one, yeah. Okay. A bit of effort. The Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory is a 6.2 million gallon pool here at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Actually, I think I'm supposed to be ready to the. You want to be ready to this out there? Yeah, let I me. Mean, so. And Chris and Bob, just a possible efficiency um, for you. We're okay with going out of order. So the plan was for us to go shield by shield, but if it makes more sense uh, for you guys to work together circumferentially around and just do all the pip pins, then the tiebacks, uh, we're good with that as well. Just whatever's gonna be easiest. Probably some kind of hybrid. All right, I have, I'm, I'm working on panel three, and uh, one pit pin is done, kind of the nadir side, and that feather loop is also installed, and also on that nadir loop is the grounding strap looped through strap. Copy, Chris. I'll uh, go down to the other one on the opposite side. Okay. On four, I guess. It is. Yeah, four. I don't think there's not enough room for both of us right there. Yeah, I don't think so.
see what you mean. The strap is wider than the yeah. block. What I ended up having to do was take my stick uh, and poke. Poke it. Yeah, once the once you get it initially through that first hole and the first part of the strap, and then and then it bunches all up. Josh, I got both pit pins, both straps, and the grounding strap. I got I'm ready for quarter turn fastening. Copy both pit pins and the grounding strap on shield three, Chris, and we concur. I've got one of the pit pins on four. Copy one on four. And on to the second one. Cassidy and Binken are now working simultaneously on these axial shields, number two and four. Kind of bunched up, made a bunch up of the loop, and then once I got that opened, I kind of partially inserted the pin, and I was able to loop it around. Loop it around, yeah. Cassidy actually removing number three first relaying some best practices to Bob Benkin as he continues to work to release number four. The chick is not getting any of it into the wall on the other side. Right, exactly that I was struggling with. Uh, Josh, do you want to do the tidying up, pinching up now on three, or should I, do you guys prefer? Um, Chris, we're taking a look right now. It looks good to us in the camera, um, as long as you're content that, uh, that it is is going to stay there. Uh, it does look good to us, and we're happy for you to move on. Uh, no, I'm not happy with it. I was just getting ready to cinch. I was wondering if you wanted to wait on cinching three or just kind of okay. Gotcha. No, go we're, yeah, we're go for you to cinch shield three. And uh, Josh, remind me where the handrail that's good for the LARP is. And Bob, you're broken. Say it again. Just uh, remind me where the generate the LARP's not from. 
Copy. So on uh, the, the kind of the top surface of the shield that you're looking at, there's two handholds, two shield handholds, and we're going to run one tether extender through each one. Lock's not there. Affirmative. I see it in your right hand. So it needs to just go through Lark's. It's going to rerun through both of them, but just Lark's not it through one, right? Uh, the, so both, is, Chris? both will end up at the end with the Lark's knot through each handhold. Yeah. Each handhold. Okay, so we use both tracks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Affirmative. And that looks good on the right, Bob. As you can see, that uh, third axial shield has been tied back and down out of the way. Cassidy is now working on axial shield number two, while Binken continues working on number four. Bob, those two larks not look good to us. For Bob, we just want to cinch the larks knots up nice and tight so that they don't have any compliance. Okay. Captures the pit pin, seal four. Copy, Bob. Both good things on field two. Chris, we copy both on two. As you can see, Bob Bengen has removed that shield number four and is working to tie it back. Opposite side, you need tie back, eh? Yeah. No problem.
and a final caution as we work towards having all the shields pulled back is to avoid the CVM ceiling surface. How long till daylight, Josh? Looks like about six minutes, Bob. Okay. Care about the inspection and doing that in the day. And Bob, that, that's exactly right. From here, once everything's tied back, you'll be uh, providing some video, doing the CBM ceiling inspection, and then we'll be packing up to go back. Okay, shield four is complete. Copy complete on four. Imagine that bag with four more adjustables in it. Yeah. It's gonna be a lot to keep track of. They all look the same. These so the next thing I can do, Josh, is just start getting ready for the inspection. It's probably a single person on top of the shield. Ask. Uh, Bob, that, that's affirmative. What we have here is uh, we'll anticipate Chris finishing off Shield 2, and if you can get the GoPro ready and turned on, uh, we'll film some footage of the CVM sur ceiling surface and give it a good inspection looking for metal and anything with vertical relief. Bob Benkin has completed attaching the fourth shield. Chris Cassidy will now continue to work removing axial shield number two. Once he has tied that back into position, the main work at this work site, node three or the tranquility module will be completed. The astronauts will clean up before heading to their next tasks. And for Chris, we're not, it's hard to see from here how far that shield's going to go when you pull it back, but we just want to make sure it doesn't end up covering your green hook. Okay. Good reminder. Thank you. And Bob, when you have a minute, we're hoping to look at uh, Shield 4 for some comments. Go ahead with the uh, 4. We just saw it moving a little bit. We wanted to make sure that the, um, the tether extenders don't have a chance of sliding up onto the dog rail portion of the, the handrails and putting more compliance into that shield. Um, if you think there's a risk of that, we'd suggest moving the tethers further radially outbound. Okay, I'll try to cinch it up a little bit more, trying to be careful not to pull too hard on those um, handrails. Yeah, we concur. Another idea might go to, to a, be to go to a separate handrail, so one more radial outboard, so that the, the tether extender kind of opens up away from the shield at a wider angle. Hashtag up uh, panel two. 
big pins installed, two larks nuts installed with his tethers. The grounding strap is through one of the tethers. Quarter turn fastener is released. And I am moving my green hook before I put this down. We copy all, Chris. It's a good configure, ready to tie it back. And we see you working, Bob, just to confirm that we don't put the safety tether over, sorry, the Lark's tether over a safety tether. Okay. Is that how you want them? It's, a, it's looser here. But, uh, And Bob, we think Shield 4 is in a good config. It's hard for us to see. We just want to make sure that it, there's no chance of it, uh, the tether riding up and over onto the dog rail and then the shield coming up towards the stove pipe. But right now, we have the separation. Yeah, it, it can't come up over the dog rail because it's hooked to the uh, standoff. But I can't make it any snugger because of uh, uh, the not long enough. Reasons. Yeah, physics. Okay, if it can't come up over, that's the part where we're not able to see from here, then uh, we can curve. I think it's good. What it can do is flop a little bit, but it is what it is without a cinching mechanism. Yeah, the flopping is fine so long as it doesn't move inboard, but uh, I, I think it looks like it's in place good. Happy. I have one, too, that's kind of in between. Yeah, we see it. A good look at all three of those axial shields removed from the node three end cone and tied back out of the way, preparing that space for the future installation of the Nanorax airlock. Okay. You have a GoPro too, Chris? Do yeah. You want to just put it in half and go around here? Yeah. Um, I've only noticed one place on about this half that's uh, it's got a little bit of a uh, something on it, like a, it's it's got a little bit of relief to it near uh, the bolts. Um, Copy, Bob. And Bob, can you take a stab at what that could possibly be? We're interested in whether or not it appears to be metal or uh, if it could be liquid or grease or something like that. I would hesitate. 
take the so like what it could be without, you know, pushing on it a little bit. It looks like a speck. It's got a little bit of a shine to it, but a lubricant could do the same thing. Copy. Coming up on four hours into today's spacewalk, you can see the astronauts are at the Node 3 work site. That's the Tranquility module. They have just tied back three axial shields, preparing this space for the future installation of the NanoRacks airlock. Vertical on your side, and Bob, we're still assessing in video. The crew is now taking footage of the work site to be relayed to the ground for future inspection. This, uh, right here, or this bolt on this side, Chris. They will then begin cleanup of the site before moving on to their next tasks, which involves cable routing. And guys, we definitely have uh, sufficient time here to try removing it with wipes or the scraper, but looking for, for your input on whether or not you think that's worth a try or something that would could be effective. Okay, I think we could try the scraper. Yeah. And we can just go right away from the bolt hole. It's a pretty small fleck. Like it, it, I'm, I'm guessing that it's a dry lube um, based on there are some other small flecks near the bolt it appear to be, uh, I guess, some dry lead. So this one is a little bit bigger than that. It's, it's bigger than a pinhead, so. But I think the thing to do is uh, just the scraper. Copy that. And so, Bob, it sounds like uh, we'll give that a try if you want to retrieve the scraper, the cats. I'll read some uh, cautionary notes to you. Of course, don't touch the FOD and uh, be careful not to push or scrape debris into or towards the CBM bolts. During their inspection of this Node 3 area, the astronauts discovered some FOD, or foreign orbital debris. They will attempt to use a tape scraper to remove that. Get into this side of the crew lock bag. Yeah. A short satellite hand over here, and you are looking at a view of the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston, Texas. The International Space Station is currently flying 268 statute miles over South Pacific Ocean. Okay. It's gonna be one of those things that comes off with a little bit of, a little push. Yeah. So 
me over here. She's not here. Hmm. She is. <laughs> oh. John, camera, while you do it. Kind of need the light on a certain angle to find it. Yeah. Chris and Bob, there's four hours, four hours. We have a seven hour PET available, limited by Bob's Medox. We're on timeline. If we pause here for the FOD, we'll probably be slightly below, but lots of time remaining. And as we see you working there, just a reminder to scrape away from the CBM bolts. We want to avoid contact with any RTLs or latches and do not use the wipe to clean the CBM sealing surface. It was, uh, it's removed. Um, it was definitely shiny, like it was uh, metallic. It's, uh, just a little bit of a bump and it, uh, it floated away. We copy. And Bob, uh, with you out there with the tools, looking for a final inspection and confirmatory that the ring now looks good. Your half of the ring looked good, right, Chris? A firm, yep. My half of the ring looks good as well. I don't see anything uh, protruding above the plane of the CBM on internal or external. Copy, Bob. Okay, so is the next to recover the larger or you bag and bring it to the airlock? That's a firm, <laughs> affirmative, Bob. Uh, all of that. You need the scoop first out of the crew lock bag, and then you're taking the or you back back to the airlock. Uh, Chris, next up for you will be an inventory of the crew lock bag. Roger. I'll just take the scoop, Bob, and I'll take both these bags back to the airlock. And pick um, up. sure. Sounds good. We copy. And that foreign object debris easily removed by the scraper used by Bob Benkin. Sorry. A little crazy. That works. That wraps up the tasks here at the Node 3 work site. I have the scoop. You got the scoop. Bob, will ask for a glove and half just before you pick your green hook up. Copy. Josh, we're ready, Chris. There's four integral reds. Three of them are blank. One of them has uh, a two extender chain. There's a small, small net. It's empty. To have the scoop, I believe. There's red to an adjustable with a wipe and scraper. And then a red to an adjustable with two wire ties. It's complete on the inside. And Chris, the inside of the bag looks good. Just let me know what's on the outside. Let me uh, do a little work. You 
moving my own rent from that. Try to take some pictures of the VM surface as well as the inventorying. Oh, we appreciate it. And just on the out, outside of the bag is uh, just a large, small adjustable. That's a good inventory, Chris, on the Kurlock bag. So from here, uh, Chris packing everything up to take both bags back, and uh, Bob basically just heading straight out to uh, your next work site. I can take a glove and a half from each of you when ready. My hat was dry. And my right glove still clean. Left glove, same flap on the index finger, and, uh, that's it. Copy I'll recover my Copy green hook. Copy. And for EV2, dry hat. Those are no change at all. They look really good. Copy, Chris. We are now four hours and 10 minutes into today's spacewalk, which started when our astronauts Chris Cassidy and Bob Benkin switched their suits to internal power at 6.12 a.m. Central Time this morning, 7.12 a.m. Eastern. So far, the astronauts have accomplished a number of tasks, the first being the installation of RITS. RITS is that robotics tool storage, which is a protective storage unit outside the International Space Station. There was also some cable routing associated with that installation. The astronauts then moved on to remove the H fixtures. One was the 1A H fixture. These were used for ground processing uh, the solar arrays prior to their launch, but needed to be removed prior to future power system upgrades. We copy. On the first attempt to remove those H fixtures on July 1st, the astronauts ran into a little bit of trouble, but they were able to remove them cleanly and quickly today. As Cassidy worked to remove the 1AH fixture, Bob Benkin completed some cleanup at the Integrated Electronics Assembly, where the most, the most recent three spacewalks have occurred. He then moved over to remove the 3BH fixture, Another successful removal. Both astronauts headed back to the airlock for a safety tether reset before moving to node three or tranquility. Once they reached tranquility, they began to prepare the area for a NanoRax airlock to be installed once it arrives later this year.
The next work for the astronauts will be more cable routing. Chris Cassidy will work to route the CP3 Ethernet cable, while Bob Benkin works to route the CP13 Ethernet cable. Across node one. Copy, Bob. After completing his cable routing, Bob Benkin will then work to remove a lens filter on one of the cameras outside of the International Space Station. You'll notice I did put some fair leads in on your tether. Start heading back. Okay. We are still taking your Ask NASA questions today, so don't be shy. Submit those on Twitter with the hashtag AskNASA and tune in to see if it is answered on air. In this one, our user would like to know if the spacewalkers have time for a snack or have any drinks within their suits. While there is no food available for the astronaut in their spacesuit, they do prefer to eat before the spacewalk. However, there is the option for the astronauts to drink inside their suits. There's a plastic water-filled pouch attached to the inside of the hard upper torso or the largest part of the upper part of the spacesuit. There's a plastic tube with a valve that sticks out of the bag, and that can be adjusted to sit near the astronaut's mouth. Biting that valve opens the tube so the spacewalker can take a drink, and releasing the bite closes the valve once again. Okay, I've got my green open. Copy, Chris. Heading back. Roger. I'm passing up the airlock. You mean to do anything here, Chris? Uh, I don't think so. I'm just going to open the thermal cover, put this one in, and grab the, the real the real bag. Yeah. We copy, Bob. Go to translate for CP13. Copy. To see the spur. Roger. A rare view of the outside of the cupola module in this shot. You can see it up near the top of your screen with the numbers one and two on those windows. The cupola is essentially the bay window of the space station. We often get pictures from the astronauts taking photos of the Earth from the cupola, but we don't always get a view from the outside. Okay, on the node one. Copy, Chris. Okay, I'm on S zero. Copy.
and thermal cover coming open. Copy, Chris. And Josh, where was the green hook listed location? And Bob, we actually had you uh, not dropping the green hook during this, but if you need to, just let us know where you want. arrived at the uh, CP-13 uh, table bundle. Copy, Bob. It should be uh, on about hand row 0269, and that's the wire tie we'll be looking to release one twist from. Copy. Let me go ahead and uh, drop my green hook down here just so that it uh, doesn't keep windshield wipering across the we copy. Okay, so the green hook. Large ORU bag and crew lock bag are in the airlock, and I have P3 reel. Copy, Chris. We'll need a safer handle check once you're down and out of the airlock again. It's complete. Both are down. Copy, Chris. We can close the thermal cover and head out to your next work site, the Rouse Nest. Okay, my green hook is on a 0270 Alpha. Copy, Bob Green on 0270 Alpha. Cover closed. Heading out. Copy, Chris. Copy, Chris. And Bob, just to be sure, the cable you pick up to route should be labeled as Whiskey 4300. Copy. Whiskey 4300, and there's also a wire tie that's labeled uh, 13. 
Copy, Bob. And so, Bob, as you know, we're just going to route that cable uh, starboard across the top of the lab. Um, your choice on the handrail locations, but let us know which, where you drop the wire ties. And, Bob, as you are getting closer to the CP13 camera, two cautions. For, as a reminder, do not use the WC antennas as a handhold and avoid inadvertent contact with that camera and light. Okay, in the rat's nest at the spider cable. Affirmative, Chris. Uh, so I believe you're looking uh, for the same bundle as you had last time. It'll be the starboard bundle. We're trying to identify W4300 um, as the one that we're going to take and mate to your cable. 4300 on, on the J4 connector. And Josh, it looks like this cable doesn't reach. Copy, Bob. We're looking. Makes it to handrail 272. Okay, we copy. You're at 272. Um, we'll have a look here, and we're probably going to end up wanting to go back and make sure that um, there's no unnecessary fair leads in uh, taking that cable up. Bob, we were going to suggest that you uh, kind of just temp secure that cable right where you are on the, the handrail that you have, and then we're going to work back up the lab, uh, up the port side, to see if we can find any slack to push forward. Gosh, I have this key. 4300J4, tap removed, tap removes on the real P4. There's no FOD, the pins are straight, EMI bands are good. Copy, Chris, that sounds good. You're go to mate, J4, W4300 to P4, W4293. It's mated. I'll start making my way out of here. And just uh, Josh, double checking W4300 is the cable that I've got. And uh, we've double checked, Bob, that's the correct cable. Okay. Working my way back. And Chris, uh, we'll probably focus on uh, finding room in Bob's cable at this point, but for you, you're basically following the same route you followed out on EVA2, and we're not picky on which handrails you use, we just ask that you report them. Okay. I'll uh, think I'm self-sufficient. I'll chime in if I need anything. Copy.
looks like the uh, SPDM is uh, right here. Copy. Are you expecting this cable to go underneath that trunnion pin cover? So trying to, the cable isn't continuously labeled, so I'm trying to make sure that I can visually still back of it. We think it should be right there by the trunnion pin cover. Copy. Bob, stand by. This view from Bob Benkin's helmet camera as he works to route the CP13 Ethernet cable. It's adjacent to the trunnion and continues around the circumference. Um, is that That's the correct routing. Can you guys give me a big picture of where this cable routes? And we can, Bob. We're just trying to make sure we get you the, the exact right words. Okay, I'll stand by. Okay, so Bob, uh, we think we're looking at the correct cable plan here, and basically uh, from the rat's nest, that cable should run port across the top of the lab, nadir, and then once it's sort of a quarter way around the lab is where it takes off towards station forward. That's the big picture. In terms of looking for ideas of slack, um, you, we'll take a confirmation from you, but we think there might be a bundle of this wire on handrail 240. That sort of uh, port side of the lab just before you get to the end cone, 24 or 260. And our thought was that if there is a bundle, uh, we might be able to do that, undo that, and secure um, some more length that way. And Bob, uh, additional to that, so reference the trunnion pin that we were looking at earlier. Um, there's a handrail near the trunnion pin. I think it's just aft of it. It's handrail 226. And we're curious to know if there's slack bundled there as well. At yeah, uh, 226, I don't believe there is any slack. I'll make my way all the way over there, but uh, from this angle, it doesn't look like any. Okay, copy. We'll take a look uh, anyway, and then, like I said, that was our, that's our first idea. If there's no slack there, then I think unfortunately we're gonna we're gonna be stuck with continuing to trace the cable station aft, 
and that's where we'll go have a look at that second handrail 240 and see if we can find any slack there. I found a, like a coil, maybe there was a of coil here at handrail 226, single coil. So if, if we can confirm that that coil is in cable 4300, then, then we should be able to undo that, I, I believe. Yeah, the, the key, and I understand, is the difficult part is to make sure we're on 4300. Yeah, and, and I think that that cable at this point appears to go into a Y. It's another cable. It is labeled 4300. Got a visual on the label, and then that joins a bundle. A larger cable. And copy, Bob, that, that's helpful. So that, that is the correct wire. We understand it runs into the Y and then the bundle. Um, and words here, we want to push any slack we can get out of that forward towards CP13. It's not, it's not really a move the slack forward, but the uh, cable itself is a three-quarter inch diameter cable that uh, goes off in both directions. So I'll, I'll start working that little bit of the slack that is available back towards CP13. Copy. Josh, I'm on the uh, cable highway, no deviations from the previous laydown, Every, each wire tie has been the same. Copy, Chris. That uh, makes it simple. Your end stop point is 3222. Two, two. Long ways from here, though. Roger that. Just for your SA, I'm at the point just past the cedar spur where the cable makes the dog leg forward. Copy. We're at the four hour, 38 minute mark in today's spacewalk, both astronauts working to route ethernet cables. You've got a view here from NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy's helmet camera. These ethernet cables will relay data from payloads on the International Space Station to their various customers.
And Bob, appreciate you um, tracing that cable back. We're still taking a deep dive on where we might be able to find some extra slack in this system, but nothing for you right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I've got the couple of additional coils of slack out of the cable at this point. I will, uh, or slack added to the end. I'm going to go ahead and secure this wire tie just so that the cable piece it's long enough is secured. It's going to be an extensive job to undo that uh, their cable and try to reposition that Y. Okay, we copy. I don't think there's much I can do with that. We copy and concur. Ask him for an extension cord. <laughs> yeah. Okay, how do you guys feel about shortcutting um, the cable instead of going around the circumference um, from this point going diagonal a little bit uh, on the end cone. And that's, uh, hey, actually we're go on that plan. Okay. I don't know if that'll give us just a little bit. Yeah, it'll, it'll give us some. We That question had been asked, we were waiting on an answer, but it sounds like we're go for that. So let's see if that gets the extra foot or two. Teams here on the ground working with Bob Bankin. This view from his camera outside the International Space Station. He is routing the CP13 Ethernet cable. And they're working to ensure he can get the full length of that cable necessary. We also have another Ask NASA question from social media. This one from Victoria, who asks, what type of preparation the astronauts do before suiting up and getting ready to head out? Do they eat anything for sustained energy? The astronauts do prefer to eat before they head out of the door, considering it can be eight or more hours before they are able to replenish themselves once they get back into the airlock. One additional thought here is that we think we only need to get to the base of the stanchion itself um, because on the camera, uh, the pigtail boom is what, the pigtail rather is what we're going to make to the cable and that has some length in it, roughly equivalent to the stanchion. So if we can just make the base of the stanchion, we think we might be able to make the connection. Hey, copy. However, another task that the astronauts complete before they suit up includes pre-breathing. That consists of two phases, and in the first, the crew breathes 100% oxygen through a mask to begin purging the nitrogen from their bodies. In the second phase is when the crew actually gets into their spacesuits and conducts that in-suit light exercise, or aisle. They move their arms and legs and raise their metabolic rate just slightly, but it helps speed up and get rid of the excess nitrogen.
And Bob, from what we're seeing in your WVS, it looks like that's going to work. I think we are going to want to uh, end up going back and just securing the wire ties along the forward end cone of the lab to kind of tuck the cable down and, and flush against it, but we have lots of time. Okay, I've got it wire tied to the racetrack, and there's about, uh, you know, it's the, the connector does make it to the base of the stanchion, so that's as far as it'll reach. Uh, we'll go back and tidy up the cable. And uh, Bob, we, we, we're happy with the cable, so we're ready for you to, to tighten up the wire ties and that on the forward edge. And we also wanted to offer it up to you while you're out here if you want to go straight ahead and take that uh, cover off now from the camera. We're good with that, whatever's easiest. I'll go ahead and go for the cover at, uh, at this point. Copy. And so, Bob, uh, with you moving on to the lens filter removal, a couple reminders. Avoid contact with the light and the camera. Uh, minimize all loads into the PTU joint and avoid imparting kick loads above the launch restraint bolts. And you just saw the completion of Bob Benkins routing that CP13 Ethernet cable. He's now moving on to remove a lens filter from a camera. Meanwhile, Chris Cassidy is also working on routing an Ethernet cable, the CP3 cable to be specific. This view is from his helmet camera, continuing to work as the International Space Station flies 262 statute miles over the Caspian Sea. Just a reminder, Bob, to have your trash bag ready. It'll be non-captive when you get it off. I've got my trash bag ready. Copy, and we're 20 seconds from the handover. Copy. This view from Bob Benkin's helmet camera as he prepares to remove that lens filter from this camera outside the International Space Station. We've got a quick handover, but we are approaching the four hour and 50 minute mark into today's spacewalk, which began at 6.12 a.m. Central Time, 7.12 a.m. Eastern. The astronauts have accomplished all of their scheduled tasks to this point, including the installation of the RITS or robotics tool storage. Copy, Bob. Good words. Last thing will be to verify the lens hood is square with the camera. And confirmation from Bob Bankin that the lens filter has been removed. 
you know, we're still looking to pick it up on the other side of the handover. So not WVS, but if uh, it looks square to you, we're good with it. It looks square, yeah, it did not move. Copy, Bob. In that case, uh, with respect to 4300, what we're looking to do, as discussed, is just tighten it up in the wire ties that are existing, and then uh, if you can, take some closeout photos for us so we're 100% certain of the new routing, and that should complete the task. Bob Benkin is going to make his way back to that cable he routed earlier. He'll be taking some photos so the teams on the ground can verify the new route of that cable while also installing some wire ties along the way. No little happy world. We copy, and uh, with that, a good time, Chris, for the reminders, avoid contact with the uh, Targe beam near CP3 and verify the cable is clear of the Targe rotational envelope. See that, it's going to lay right on top. It is laying right on top of the previous laid cable and uh, confirm it is all clear. Copy. So far. Yes, I will put in uh, one wire tie on handrail 0272. Copy, Bob. And then the uh, cable itself is going to go inboard of the two antennas. If you uh, continue the cable routing, uh, I, I think I can't put it over the top of those. Uh, and Bob, we copy. Uh, it's still no WVS here, but we're good with that routing. Okay. Go ahead and uh, check the green light. And uh, yeah, I got a green light. Josh, what's my ending handrail? Two, right? Three, two, 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 two. And Chris, uh, A firm, three, triple two, 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 two. And for Bob, uh, that the issue's on us with KU. It's not you. And Chris, on that handrail three triple two, we want to use two wire ties to secure the bundle. Yeah, two wire ties. And that is where I am right now. Three triple two. Copy. 
As you can see, we do not have video communication with the International Space Station currently, as we are in a satellite handover. However, we do have audio communication and teams here on the ground, specifically Ground IV Josh Kutrick, a Canadian Space Agency astronaut there in the center of your screen, is communicating with Chris Cassidy, astronaut outside the International Space Station on today's spacewalk. Cassidy has been working to route a CP3 Ethernet cable along the outside of the station. now approaching the end of that task, working to stow the bundle, the wire, the cable bundle, to a specific handrail outside the station. With sunset approaching, you can see NASA astronaut Bob Behnken. You can tell it's him with those red rings around the legs of his spacesuit. That designates him as Spacewalker 1. With the backdrop of our mega solar arrays, both he and fellow spacewalker today, Chris Cassidy, are on their 10th spacewalk. Yeah, I'm pointing the GoPro along the length of the cable. On the uh, port side, there is a strut or a cable tray of some sort that comes across. The cable goes underneath that into the original handrail. Uh, it was a tether to, and then that original tether where it was holding the bundle is uh, still captive of the cable. And I basically had this shortcut underneath the following two handrails, straight up and over that handrail that I gave you the uh, number of that I installed the wire tie on. Basically, I ended up skipping two of the circumferential handrails to get to uh, that location. And Bob, we copy. We do have your WVS back yet. Um, we think that's a good, we're, we're checking on the fact that, uh, like you said, you skipped two of the circumferential handrails. We'll get right back to you on that. The cable is as secure as the other cables that are out here. Copy. What it's worth.
Okay, three triple two. Two wire ties are in the build up bundle. It is at no risk of uh, interfering with the charge rotational envelope. Copy, Chris. Uh, it looks good. We're still waiting on uh, one go back with Bob, so it might be a good time for the final club and half check. Half dry. Clubs look good. They survived the wire tie. Great. Ooh. Copy, and Chris. Jack, I can just go for a wire tie and try to secure, add one more wire tie to the radial handrail. 80. That will help the cause. And Bob, uh, not needed. We're we're getting word that we're happy with the routing. We we weren't overly concerned with uh, the, how the cable was tied down. There was a question here about how it ran across the forward uh, micro MMOD shield, um, but we're content with it now and happy to head back in. And so that, with that, guys, uh, a couple cleanup items. Um, Bob, we check you heading back in, and Chris, just before you make your way in, we're, we're ready for the uh, inventory of that real bag whenever you are. Oh, boy, okay. Do you need a glove and hat for me, Josh, or you can do that. Don't let stop right now before I pick up my green hook and head back. And Bob, uh, hey, firm, we'll take it now. My hap is dry, uh, RTV on my left hand looks about the same, just a flap on the index finger, and there is a, a little bit more off of the palm, kind of in the, right below the base of the index finger. And my right glove still looks to be pristine. Okay. To my green hook and then start making my way back. Copy, Bob, and we concur. Green hook up and back to the airlock. Uh, for Bob and Chris, we just passed the five hour mark. Five hours, we're still good out to a seven hour PET, but obviously we're on the way back in. Copy. teams here on the ground confirming they are satisfied with the work Bob Bankin has conducted routing that Ethernet cable. Josh, you ready? We're ready. Okay. You have the real bag it, itself. On the outside, there is a wire tie caddy with nine wire ties in it. There are two adjustables going from the wire tie caddy attached to the bag. There is a long duration tie down tether. And there is a RET, an adjustable, a cap and a plug. And the Copy, Chris, that's a good config on the bag. On the plug remains on the uh, end of the cable we just paid out. Yeah, we can Kirk. Good bag. Okay. And you just heard NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy, the commander of the International Space Station, reporting out on the inventory of his real bag. We have all the camera gear with us, so two GoPros and a still camera between the two of you. That's affirmative. I've got a still camera and a GoPro. And I have a GoPro, a mutt, and a um, adjustable. Sounds good. I guess there's a red on there, too. Yeah, red on there, too. Copy. Yeah, 
retrieved my green hook. Copy, Bob. for As you can see from Commander Chris Cassidy's helmet camera, he is now on his way back in toward the airlock. We're at five hours and eight minutes into today's spacewalk. Let's take a look back at everything the astronauts have accomplished. Today was scheduled to be a battery replacement spacewalk. However, the first three of this series of four, the astronauts worked so swiftly that they completed those battery removal and replacements in the last spacewalk. There's still one more battery that needs to be installed. It's already on the International Space Station following a lithium ion battery tripping last Last year, it will be installed in a future spacewalk. But today, the astronauts made it on internal battery power at 6.12 a.m. Central Time, 7.12 a.m. Eastern Time. Their first task was to install the RITS, or the Robotics Tool Storage, a protective storage unit outside the space station. It's permanently installed now to the Mobile Base System, or MBS. Inside the RITS are two RELs. That stands for Robotics External Leak Locators. Those are attached to the inside of the RITS, and the RELs can be picked up by the Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator. That's Dexter. It's essentially the hand of the Canada Arm 2, and those RELs can be used to detect ammonia leaks on the outside of the space station. Following installation of the RITS and the necessary cables needing to be routed, the astronauts moved on to remove some H fixtures. My uh, waist tether is closed and locked on the airlock D-ring extender with my anchor hook and my right waist tether, and then my right D-ring extender has the crew lock, on, crew lock side closed and locked. You agree I'm gonna unhook my tether. Chris, we copy you closed and locked to the airlock D-ring extender, and you have a go to release uh, your anchor. Copy. I got all see you there. The astronauts' second task they accomplished today was the removal of the 1AH fixture. Scoop in there. This was first attempted on July 1st and was met with some trouble, but with the proper tools today, the astronauts were able to release those H fixtures for future power system upgrades. I see the gates closed.
As Chris Cassidy removed that 1AH fixture, Bob Benkin worked to clean up the integrated electronics assembly from the previous three spacewalks. He then moved to the 3BH fixture and removed that smoothly as well. Roger. Both astronauts then made their way back to the airlock for a safety tether reset, preparing them for the next task. That task was preparation of Node 3's end cone, also known as Tranquility, for the attachment of the NanoRacks airlock later this year. The NanoRacks, NanoRacks airlock will arrive on a SpaceX rocket later this fall, and it will be the first commercial airlock on the space station. You can see the astronauts now heading into the airlock once again, but now because all of their tasks are complete. I'm in. Happy. Transition to the airlock. Ring extender. Following the preparation of the Node 3 end cone, which included tying back three axial shields, both astronauts went on to route Ethernet cables. Chris Cassidy focused on the CP3 Ethernet cable while Benkin worked on routing the CP13 cable. He then also removed a lens filter from the CP13 area. My left waist tether is closed and locked to the air, airlock D ring extender. Copy that, Bob. Uh, with that, you can pick up your anchor, stow it on your mini workstation. Complete. And Bob, can we can we just And Bob, we just want to verify your the small hook of your waist tether is to your D ring extender locked. It is closed and locked by D ring extender. Copy that. We'll pick the anchor up, ingress, and a reminder to have one final look at that pit pin as you go by it, please. Okay. I don't, uh, don't see the pit pin. Yeah, it's not. Uh, not installed. Thank you for floated over here to the, the back. Oh, oh. And uh, Bob, we we copy, so, and we're uh, we're looking in your WVS. I've uh, reinstalled the pip pin. Copy, Bob, thanks. Yeah, I floated all the way over behind this uh, white little in the hole that's on that support. Roger. Anything else, Josh? I'm just uh, looking around the room one last time, shall I? And Bob, uh, if you don't mind, since we do have lots of time, we're at 515, um, we would like you to take that pip pin out again, actuate the detent mechanism, and just see if you can see whether or not the ball detents are working and, and moving. Station clean. You want me to take anything? Um, I think I'm pretty good. I could uh, turn off the GoPro, but uh, I think that would be probably not not worth the worth the effort. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm able to actuate the uh, PIP pin when it is not installed. I'm kind of can't do is I can pull it back out. You can see that on my WVS. Yeah, we can uh, see it. I can pull it up. Then when I push it in, it stays in. Might be a way to push it in and then try to um, hold on to the collar and I reinsert it. We're happy for you to give that a try. Okay, so if I insert the pit pin and hold on to the collar, I can secure it, I can get it to get stuck in there. So I can pull out the spring mechanism. I don't know how long it will stay like that because it just needs to get bumped and then it will compress again. But it's, it's a captive if it gets snagged right now, but if you push it in, it will, it will stay that way. To cycle it a several times just to see if we can get it to pop back out. I don't know if that's a value to you or not. Okay, thanks, Bob. That's very value. Yeah, very good info. We we can see it in your WVS, and uh, I think we're we're pretty much finished up with it. So we'll leave it inserted as best you can, and that'll be it. With Chris Cassidy now inside the airlock, this is a view from the helmet camera of Bob Benken. He's troubleshooting a PIP pin. That stands for push and pull. And so, Bob, unable to see, but uh, you are going to close the thermal cover and attach the Velcro strap. And Bob Benkin is now also heading back inside the airlock with a go to close that thermal cover. The large or you bag is large now, isn't it? Yeah. And this view inside the International Space Station. And Bob, I think you're looking at the same thing as us. Similar to last time, if you can, hold the handrail and try to pop it back out to get rid of that gap in the thermal cover. A view back inside from Bob Benkin's helmet camera. You can see that thermal cover of the hatch is closed. Uh, I cycled it several times. It's, uh, it's about the extent of it. Keep trying. Okay, copy, Bob. Thanks. We're, it sounds like the limit is five inches, but um, that looks to be, it's certainly less than it was, so. Yeah, it looks all about the same to me. It's probably about three inches uh, or less on the forward side and maybe four on the aft. Copy. Continue uh, inbound. So Bob and Chris onto the SCU steps 
you can remove your SCUs from the storage pouches, remove your DCM covers, Velcro to the DCM, and connect your SCUs. Let me know when that's done. That's in work. Okay, in work. Just trying to keep your feet from down into the thermal cover there. Oh, okay. My SCU is locked. You two SCU locked. Copy locked on both. And this view from the equipment lock portion of the Quest airlock. To off forward and expect a water off message. Water is off. Water off. Copy. We're starting the timer. That's NASA astronaut Doug Hurley awaiting his crewmates. They're currently in the crew lock portion of the Quest airlock. Still waiting on the opportunity to close the hatch. However, the spacewalk does not end until repressurization begins. bags in here. Luckily the Ritz and Team Dave made it happen, so. Amen. Congratulations again to the H fixture team that uh, coming up with a plan with Oso's help to get those uh, two fixtures removed. Thanks, Bob. And Bob, that's the two minutes. So for Bob, verify outer hatch clear of hardware. Okay, the outer hatch is clear of hardware. Bob, verify handle position per hatch decal. Okay, handle position is per the hatch decal. Bob, close and lock the hatch. Okay. Also now in view inside the equipment lock portion of the Quest airlock, Roscosmos cosmonaut Anatoly Ivanishin. and the astronauts are closing the hatch. Yeah, 
hatch is closed and locked. Copy, Bob. So into the pre-repress steps for EV1 and 2, we want to check SCU connected to DCM. Verify for EV1. Verify EV2. Copy. EV1 and 2, check water switch is off. EV1, water switch is off. EV2, water off. EV1, check EV hatch closed and locked. The EV hatch is closed and locked. EV2 on the UIA, check oxygen for EMU 1 and 2 valves, both of them open. Oxygen, EMU 1, EMU 2, both valves open. EV2 on the UIA, you can switch power for EV1 and 2, both to on, and check that the power EV, EMU 1 and 2 lights are on. EV1, EV2, power is on, 2 EMU Copy. EV2, check the EV1 and 2 voltages. EV1 and EV2 voltage are both 18.6. I copy 18.6 on both. EV1 and 2 on your DCM switch power to SCU. Expect a warning tone. EV1 coming to SCU. EV2 SCU. Copy SCU on both. So Chris and Bob, a pleasure working with you today. Thanks for the help, and I will turn you over to Doug. Good luck on the rest of your mission. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate Good job. It. Yep. Okay, welcome back on your DCMs. Take your O2 actuator to press. Work. In work. EV1, O2 actuator is in press. EV2, O2 actuator in press. Copy both in press. Bob, check the EV hatch. MPEV is closed. Copy. The EV hatch, MPEV is closed. Okay, next I'm going to start uh, throttling uh, the uh, IV hatch equalization valve. Just let me know if uh, it's too much, and I'll throttle it uh, slowly to norm. I'll copy. Give you one copy. Give you two copy. We are now approaching the five and a half hour mark into today's spacewalk. Yes, even though the hatch is closed and the astronauts are back inside the crew lock portion of the Quest airlock, the timer still continues as it will not stop until repressurization of that portion begins. Okay, it's in norm. When uh, we get to 4.0, it's expect an alert tone. Copy, copy. Good rate for EV1. Good rate, EV2. See, good rate. We're stopped at 5.0, and we're timing for two minutes for stabilization. Copy.
And with the beginning of repressurization of the Quest airlock, we have the end of today's spacewalk. That rounds out at five hours and 29 minutes from the time the astronauts switched their suits to battery power at 6.12 a.m. Central Time this morning, 7.12 Eastern, and ending at 11.41 a.m. Central Time, 12.41 p.m. Eastern, with the beginning of repressurization. Funnies with that, huh? With display and then yeah. like a debris and a cable that was too short. Yeah. But the H fixers came through, so that's good. Well, does the last one feel like the first one? Or the tenth one feel like the first one? I don't want to. Presuppose any basis. <laughs> no, a little more comfortable on your tenth one than the first one. Views always amazing, though. Yeah. Hey, there's two minutes, and it was stable. We'll wait one more minute. Cassidy and Bankin discussing their experiences today. Both of them have just completed their 10th spacewalk. Okay, there's another minute, and pressure's still stable. Go ahead and check uh, your glove heaters are, are off. V1 glove heaters are off and yep. no contamination. V2 glove heaters off and no contamination. Okay, copy both. On your DCM, take your O2 actuator to IV. Doesn't work. TV1, O2 actuator is IV, TV2, O2 actuator IV. Copy both in IV. We're going to open up the uh, equalization valve again. Just let me know uh, how it uh, feels as we get all the way back to uh, normal. Copy. Equalization valve is in normal. Copy. Good rate for EV1. Good rate EV2. EV2, good rate. Expect a alert tone when we get close to uh, DPDP is zero. Copy. Air molecules hustle back in here a lot faster than they hustle out of here. Because science. Because science, yep.
kind of have that feeling where the like the divers are swimming me through the wall right now. Yeah, just totally relax. Except that I don't feel like I've mortgaged the future as much as I typically would on a NBL run. Thank you. <laughs> RTV peel off on your left hand again, or did they say it stay good? No, they are rock solid, both of them. And with the conclusion of today's spacewalk at 5 hours and 29 minutes, let's take a look at some spacewalk statistics. This was the 231st spacewalk in support of space station assembly and maintenance, the seventh this year. This, me this makes the fourth spacewalk for the Expedition 63 crew. It's the tenth spacewalk for Bob Behnken, and his total time spacewalking is 61 hours and 10 minutes. It's also the tenth spacewalk for Chris Cassidy, his total reaching 54 hours and 51 minutes. Today's spacewalk lasted five those 231 in support of station assembly and maintenance. That equals 60 days, 12 hours, and 3 minutes of spacewalking time. Also notable for Chris Cassidy, he is now ninth on the all-time list of spacewalking time, while Binken is now fourth on the all-time list for spacewalk time. They both, now with 10 spacewalks, tie Michael Lopez Alegria and Peggy Whitson as the only other spa U.S. astronauts con to conduct 10 spacewalks in their career. Be pretty close. Depressurization continues in the Quest airlock and this look inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room. We're going to go to post-EVA, step one. That's Flight Director Allison Bollinger in the black jacket. She led the teams throughout the spacewalk today. NASA astronaut Doug Hurley opening that hatch between the crew and equipment lock portion of the Quest airlock. Okay, copy that. Houston, if you can take care of step four. Step four is in work. And airlock step four is complete, so at this time uh, the EV crew is no longer hot mic to the ground. We do still have your data and you're go to continue.
That's the voice of NASA astronaut Anne McLean now serving as the CAPCOM for the crew now that they are back inside the International Space Station. And as they bring Cassidy and Behnken back and help them doff their suits, another look at the accomplishments of today's spacewalk. The spacewalk began when our astronauts switched their suits to internal battery power at 6.12 a.m. Central Time, 7.12 a.m. Eastern. The first task was the installation of the robotics tool storage, also known as RITS, a storage unit outside the station that will provide thermal and physical protection for tools. After installing RITS and routing some associated cables, Cassidy moved on to remove the 1A H fixture. The H fixtures were used for ground processing solar arrays prior to launch, but needed, needed to be removed for future power upgrades. The first attempt to remove these was on the July 1st spacewalk. With no luck on that day, the astronauts returned today and were able to more easily release those fixtures. As Cassidy removed the 1AH fixture, Bob Benkin worked to clean the integrated electronics assembly area after the last three spacewalks in that location. He then moved on to remove the 3BH fixture, another one of those necessary for removal for future power system upgrades. Once those tasks were complete, the astronauts headed back to the airlock for a safety tether reset. This prepared them for their next task, NanoRacks airlock preparation. The NanoRacks airlock will be the first commercial airlock, and it will launch on a SpaceX rocket later this fall. Our astronauts headed out to the Node 3, or Tranquility, end cone. Here they removed they tied back three axial shields, preparing that space for the future airlock to be installed once it arrives later this year. After completing the work at the Node 3 area, both astronauts moved on to some cable routing. Chris Cassidy routed the CP3 Ethernet cable, while Bob Benkin focused on the CP13 cables. And once complete, Benkin moved on to remove a lens filter from a camera in the CP13 area. The spacewalk was originally planned to continue power upgrades through the removal of nickel hydrogen batteries with their replacements, lithium ion batteries. However, these two astronauts worked swiftly through those procedures in the first three spacewalks of this series, therefore leaving the opportunity for today's task to be completed. All in all, that totals out at a five hour, 29 minute spacewalk and a big thumbs up from Chris Cassidy.
And with Chris Cassidy back in the equipment lock portion of the Quest airlock, we now see Bob Benkin has been brought in as well. Anatoly Ivanishin and Doug Hurley working to remove the SAFER, the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, that sort of jetpack backpack we discussed. Fortunately, that was not used today, as it's only intended for a crew member to maneuver independently of the space station in case they were to become detached from a tether. The International Space Station currently flies 269 statute miles over Chile, and a big accomplishment today for these two spacewalkers. Both just completed their 10th spacewalk. This puts them in a tie with Michael Lopez Al Alegria and Peggy Whitson. They are now the only other U.S. astronauts to conduct 10 spacewalks in their career. Chris Cassidy is also now in ninth place on all-time spacewalking list, and Bob Benkin is fourth on that list.
as our astronauts prepare to doff or remove their suits. Another look at today's spacewalk statistics. It was the 231st spacewalk of Space Station Assembly and Maintenance, the seventh spacewalk this year, and the fourth of Expedition 63. Of all spacewalks conducted through Expedition 63, they total at 23 hours and 37 minutes. It was Chris Cassidy's 10th spacewalk. He now has a total of 54 hours and 51 minutes of spacewalk time and is ninth on the all-time spacewalking list. Bob Benkin also completed his 10th spacewalk and now has 61 hours, 10 minutes of spacewalk time, fourth all-time on that list. They both tie with Michael Lopez Alegria and Peggy Whitson as the only other U.S. astronauts to conduct 10 spacewalks throughout their career. But of these 231 spacewalks at the space station, that time totals up to 60 days, 12 hours, and 3 minutes. And, uh, if you could just give me a thumbs up when you hear me. Uh, we were seeing a little bit of a smudge on Chris's WVS camera. Uh, so before you take the helmet off or as you take the helmet off, we're wondering if you could just peek at his center camera on his helmet to see if you happen to see anything uh, like a smudge on it or something uh, attached to the front of that camera. As they remove the helmets today, the crew on board the space station will take an extra look at the WVS on Chris Cassidy's helmet. That's the wireless video station, wireless video system, or uh, the helmet camera that you saw today. This isn't the only dynamic activity for the International Space Station this week. On Thursday, we'll be looking forward to the Progress 76 launch and docking. Those will both occur on this Thursday, July 23rd. Coverage for launch begins at 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern, and launch itself will happen at 9.26 a.m. Central, 10.26 Eastern. After a short flight in space, Progress 76 will arrive at the space station the same day. Coverage begins at 12 p.m. Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, and docking itself should take place at 12.47 p.m. Central, 1.47 p.m. Eastern time. You can tune in and watch live on nasa.gov slash live. And Doug, we can, we can address that after you guys uh, get them out of the suit. So uh, after we hang up the helmet, when we have a minute, we'll take a look at it. Sounds good. Thanks, Sam. Today's spacewalk lasted 5 hours and 29 minutes, starting at 6.12 a.m. Central Time, 7.12 Eastern, and ending at 11.41 a.m. Central Time, 12.41 p.m. Eastern. Today, our astronauts accomplished the installation of the new external storage space for robotic equipment, known as RITS. They also removed two H fixtures for future power system upgrades and prepared the Node 3 end cone for future installation of the NanoRacks airlock. They also completed some pa power cable routing on the outside of the station and removed a camera lens filter. 
with our astronauts back safe inside and their helmets removed. That's going to wrap up our coverage of today's spacewalk. Thanks for joining us. This is Mission Control Houston.